Folks, I've got a super fun and easy to tutorial for all of us out there today. It's a great way to burn up our scraps and or the simplest way to ever make a log cabin quilt block. Are you ready? Let's get stitching. Well, well, welcome back everybody to another great episode of So Well. I am your carefree quilting host, Rob Appel. I'm super blessed to have all of you out there. If you have not yet subscribed, please do so right now. I promise to keep you entertained. And it is definitely starting to look more and more like a quilt shop around here. Quilts on top of quilts on top of quilts. And that is because today we are doing the easiest form of the log cabin quilt ever. And in my personal opinion, the log cabin quilt block, if you follow my less than accurate instructions is the easiest block for quilting. So a great place to start. Super fun, super uh, easy to design with, but there are a couple of few steps. So I know I can get long winded folks, please stick with me. I want to discuss several options within our log cabin and talk about the history, a little bit of the log cabin before we make some really cool log cabin blocks together. I promise we'll do some sewing and I promise not to drag this on too long, but I really want to talk about the log cabin and how these were formed. And so yes, last night I got real excited and I dumped out a bunch of my scraps that I knew would work well together. These are from the last few projects I've been doing with my New Worlds fabrics. Uh, so they were all color coordinated is what I'm trying to say. And um, I also wanted to bring in some of these fabrics here, which we're gonna kind of use as our conversation with the low volume neutrals. So that's why the crazy set decor today, folks. And yes, I've gotten a little OCD uh, or carried away maybe with my, uh, my quilts. But what I wanna talk about, this quilt I did years and years ago, but it's a super fun free form log cabin. And when I say free form, hopefully you can see that the blocks themselves are not only different sizes, but they're not constructed perfectly crisp and symmetrical like the block on the table is. So like I said, we're going to discuss several different blocks. This quilt and this quilt here are the same style of construction, meaning a, meaning a bit more free form, a bit more carefree in the piecing. But this one is a real wild bright project. So they have completely different reads and completely different feels. And this is one of the reasons that a log cabin quilt block can be actually very expressional and very fun and a great way to constantly use up our scraps if you're like me, you're probably shopping in fabrics that are similar. So you end up with these piles that all work beautiful together, but you've just got bits and pieces from other things you've made. And these are perfect, especially for more of a carefree log cabin. So whether we're building something really bright and colorful or low volume and high contrast, which was the goal in this project, we're gonna just cut, look at a few simple steps and hopefully I'll be able to give you all of that information today as we get started. So first, First of all, why the red squares, right? You see, I'm even traditionally, whether I'm using a big, a medium, or, or an itsy bitsy small square, like I've done in both of the projects behind me, originally the red was representing the fireplace or the center of the home, the center of the heart, the heart of the home, all of these things. So the log cabin block traditionally, the often almost always had a red square in the middle. Now that doesn't mean you have to use red throughout the rest of the project which I think it makes it really fun. It can be a real pop color. That's what I was trying to express in this project, right? Okay. And again, the more I think you know about designing and options and the freedom within, the easier the instructions towards the middle of the video are going to make sense, right? So in this quilt here, I've used the exact same fabrics to represent the two different sides. We're gonna call this the green side and the purple side now. In this quilt, we could call it the solids and the low volume neutrals or the print side. But you're basically gonna build two sides of your log cabin uh, that are going to build in a stitching format around this center block, this red center square. So what I like to do is often work in high contrast colors, whether it's the purple and the green versus the orange and the reds, or these 
uh, solids against these, um, you know, low volume neutrals like this. So you can see in today's demonstration, we're going to mostly use like a, a low volume neutral side, but we need to get into cheating a little bit of our yellows and oranges because this is going to be a terrific quilt when it comes together. And then we're usually mostly blues and purples over on this side. So we'll be able to tell what blocks we're doing, even if we're using different size blocks throughout today's conversation, right? So that's one of the first things is that we're going to start with our center square and we're going to build different size. Oh, excuse me. We're going to build our pieces around that. Now, traditionally in a log cabin, that's what we do. And it's very simple. So let's start with that. And most of the time in a log cabin, all of our pieces are going to be the same size pieces. So let's just start with our medium square for today. And I've got my fabrics now organized um, in color palette. When I first dumped them all out, they were all over and it was a lot of fun, but it started becoming harder and harder to find. And if you really look carefully, I've actually stacked my smaller pieces on top of my bigger pieces. So this is going to help for a lot of scrap management. So for now, let's make sure we're going to go ahead and make a bunch of strips the easiest way possible. We're going to make everything down to equal sizes. Okay, because in the first block I was showing you and in the traditional blocks, we have everything at about the same size. So let's just quickly, so we can move qu through the video, let's just stack this up. And I'm going to now make uh, one and a half inch strips. And you can see, I just guessed at that number, but they're gonna all be the same, okay? So we're just gonna go ahead now and I'm gonna slice a couple of one and a half inch strips. And what I'm gonna show you now is a bit more of a stitch press trim method. And this really actually can help build up a bit of our accuracy, but this is really best served in these freestyle, a little bit more wonky blocks. If you're really going for the accuracy, like we were talking about in this first piece where everything's the same size, the other trick is, if this was a one and a half inch square, I know you can see it's larger. If this was a one and a half inch square, then this would be a one and a half inch square. Okay. Then this is going to be a one and a half inch strip. Those one and a half and those one and a half together make three minus the half. So now we're at two and a half. So this is going to be cut in advance. This is what I'm getting at in advance to one and a half by two and a half. So it fits along that distance, right? And that would be stitched in. And then the next piece over here would be the same. And we're going to build our way around our center square. And the key for real precision precision, which is not the shirt I'm wearing today, would be to both measure the width of the strip and the length of the strip and make sure that you're sewing from corner to corner. What we're going to do is we're going to stitch on and we're, oh, and we're going to trim as we press. Let's get that iron hot today and a little space on our board as we start moving through. So you can see, okay, I've cut a couple of one and a half inch strips of my, what will be light fabrics. And now let's go ahead and um, let's go ahead and make sure we've got some one and a half inch strips of our other. Okay. So like I was saying, if we're doing this real accurately, now what we're going to do is we're going to measure this strip. This is two inches. So now I'm going to take from my lightest piece and I'm going to cut exactly a two inch by that one and a half inch so that I can take this piece here and I can go right sides together and I can go to a quarter inch seam allowance. And I'm going to want to maintain this exact same quarter inch seam allowance. So an edge guide might be very handy. I find regardless of the method I'm teaching, I really do prefer to press away from center after each piece I add. So our next strip whoop, will need to be, if you're looking down on the ruler here, three inches. So I'm going to build kind of from my light to my dark in both color families as I go out. So my next lightest piece here and to help increase accuracy, I'm going to go ahead and make sure I now have a three inch strip. So this is all fine and dandy folks, but this is partly what I think makes a log cabin 
cabin annoying for some of us freestyle quilters because it's really a lot of trimming and cutting in advance. Okay, now I'm going to start to sew on the opposite color family and let's do another measure and we're gonna measure and we are still at three inches, which makes sense. And I'm gonna come through here and I'm gonna find my lightest and I'm gonna make myself another three inch cut. Oop, right sides together. And again, pressing after each row we stitch on. Okay, next one's gonna be, I believe, a four inch, and that's why I like to use one and a half inch strips. They seem to help us with that math. You see now we're at a four inch strip. Okay, so then my next color up in my color family, I can just cut a four inch strip. And I'll go ahead and sew that on here as I continue to log cabin around. The simple, and these are the true and accurate instructions that you would normally be doing. But I have promised all of you the easiest log cabin ever. And now we've got to be 25 minutes into the video and we're about ready to get there. So I appreciate you sticking with me. And let's talk about some log cabin blocks that aren't necessarily perfect as we continue to talk about the log cabin theory in general as we move on. I personally really have a good time making log cabin blocks that look like this. If you look carefully, folks, you'll notice that there are different width strips used throughout. And I think that helps and builds fun character. But what that won't allow us to do is to go back to a design wall and put all of those log cabins back together in a perfect grid. Please notice that my logs are floating all around. This is a uh, disorganized development, we'll call it. Uh, so these are more of random sizes as well. And I'm going to show you how to marry multiple size blocks together to continue building in more of a flexible, creative log cabin. So that's part of what I like the look in here, as well as if you look at these, these are extremely wonky. And I've been doing this by doing a lot more of a diagonal style piecing. There is no foundation being used in here, but you can see that the seams are fairly crisp. The block is laying fairly flat. And this is also just because of the same sewing pressing, trimming techniques we're gonna go ahead and use throughout the rest of today's video. So this is now where we're getting into the easiest log cabin ever, and that I think is really to go a little bit more freestyle, folks, and that is to have different blocks that line up differently, which allows you to use a different variety of scrap and not be so precise on either the color placement or the fabric choice or the piecing or anything, and these become a lot of very fun blocks that you could do individually in between projects and then build a really awesome quilt. Now, as we start to work, we want to really try to get this ah uh, log cabin -y effect going back and forth through the stack. I have a sample here that I've brought out, and I want to point out here, you can see in this block, I've got a couple of the seams that are starting in the same position. Now, I was watching TV while I was prepping some of these blocks. Again, this was just my fun sewing time. So if you pay attention, this overlap won't happen where you have two starting in the same point. You can get the real stacking log cabin look. But if it happens in a busier log cabin format like this, it's going to be much harder to see visually than it would if you're doing a very accurate log cabin where you need each one of those colors to kind of form their rays if we've seen in the traditional log cabin. So I'm pointing this out because we can work around this if we pay attention. So everything we're gonna discuss can be used in traditional log cabin making other than the lack of accuracy. So let's get into a little bit of that sloppy sewing and have some fun with that. And for that, let's start with um, 
one of these bigger pieces here uh, as we, you know what? Hey, let's just keep having fun. Who says we can't be uh, freedom? This is all of our own projects. So um, what I wanted to really tell you is I've started with a variety of squares for this project. I'm gonna build all of these scraps into a beautiful log cabin, but I have a variety of, uh, but no smaller than one and a half inches for me, because that's going to be very, very uh, uh, consumed up in the seam allowances all the way up to, I believe this is a two and a half inch square. Um, and so these are going to work beautifully as we go. So now we're going to go ahead and take on this project again, and we're going to keep looking at this. And so what we want to do here is back to what we were just discussing, not having the colors double stack. This was our shorter of the two so we're going to start on this side again with our next darkest color. Now, as we bring in our next darkest color for me, folks, because I have a very few of my lights or my neutrals, I'm going to use the back side of this. That's legal. And I'm going to go, look, you probably didn't even notice. That's this one right here. I've been using it in all of the blocks. Okay. So that's totally legal to flip that fabric over as I need. And because we're going to now discuss wonky, I'm not going to trim it first. I'm just going to go ahead and lay it on here and we're going to quickly boost ourselves into hyperspace on wonky. And not only am I going to lay it on here, but I am also going to give us a diagonal stitch as we begin. So I've gone further than on both sides. I'm setting my diagonal and at the moment I'm not going to trim yet, but I find that that can be very beneficial. I don't have a seam guide on the top of my machine that would be getting in the way. And I don't have an edge guide on my foot because that'll get in the way if I'm sewing without both edges being the same. So now I'm going to use my top layer as my guide as I stitch through. Just looking at that as I go. Hit your thread cutter and okay. Now what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to trim, just protecting our hands here. It doesn't have to be a perfect quarter inch, but I'm going to trim out the excess. And if you were working on foundation, you'd want to do that, of course, and not be cutting through your foundation. Working on foundation may help a little bit, if you're using some very loose weave fabric, but this should be just fine as it is. Okay, this is pretty cool. Now you can see here, we're starting to do less than accurate looking sewing, something that's got some character. Okay, and for the next piece, I'm gonna go ahead and set a bit of an angle and I might wanna use, because I wanna stay somewhat square, the straight line here of the piece that went in on an angle, and now that's going to create a new angle here. And so if I take just this piece first, the side on the light side, I should have pointed that out. We're on the light side. And if we trim this off here, now that gives us a real nice straight cut. And I've got to stop doing this where I put it in right sides together. So now what I'm going to go ahead and make sure I've got my right sides up. We're going to use that same fabric and it's still got the overlap I need. Okay, just enough there. So you're starting to sew a little bit on an angle that can be tricky, but now you know right where your quarter inch is. You see that? Because we've already trimmed it off. And even though you're looking at the right side of the fabric, this is the one I was going to show you the wrong side of the fabric, but I did it last night too. I just keep putting them right sides down. We don't have anything to trim this time. So we're going to go straight to the ironing board. This is now it's speeding up the process and making it for me even more fun and entertaining as we work through our blocks. Now, the natural tendency is just to pick up the cutter and not your ruler, but let's be careful. And actually you'll notice I'm not going to trim these sides off yet because I'm probably going to get to them in a moment. Let's keep making this thing a little oblong. Now this has got a new angle to it right up here. So if I bring this on, cause I'm going to be sewing on the blue side. Now this is the shorter of the two blue sides. So now this is the side we start on to keep that overlap proper. And my trim is now, set off of the new piece that went in on an angle. So you can see I'm cutting off a variety piece, right? And now I just want to find, find something fun from my blue stash. And um, yeah, let's use this one. I like that. Oh, I want to use this one first. Okay. Again, trying to build up my lighter to the darker. So now again, this is long enough. Things are traveling at angles. So again, I've got a little bit of overlap. Folks, this is scrap. Once we get down to a piece like this, you are more than welcome to toss it into the dog bed pillowcase to be stitched up later and donated to the Humane Society. Did you hear? I just gave you a whole new lesson right there. And as we're stitching through, stitching through, 
Really fun and easy. Okay, again, I had pre-trimmed, so I don't have to trim now. And as I press over here, watch what starts to happen. Coming back into this side, where this is the second longer piece of the blue, so this is the next side I'm putting on, and I've already got an angle developing, and I can come here, or I can do a different angle, which we'll do just for the fun of it. And as I trim here, folks, look what's happened. I have now trimmed all of those excess pieces off, and I've set the quarter inch allowance. So now I can come up here and cheating down to maximize my scrap. I can come on over here and get right into stitching this down quarter inch style. So if you were always trimming like that first and then pressing, you could be using the edge guide on your machine, but sometimes you're gonna to wanna to do some real wonky stitching and you're gonna to wanna to do some pieces that kind of float in on top. And so therefore, I just find that using the seam tape or the edge of my foot is gonna work best. Okay, so where are we at? We're working our log cabin back down. Remember, you find the shorter of the two pieces of the color side you're working on right? So that's this one. So that means we're going to be sewing a seam across here and we can do whatever we wanted really. So I'm just going to again trim this down. Even though I'm still using the pre-cut one and a half inch strips, you can see that I'm getting a much, whoop, thread picker. I'm getting a much more interesting variety as we go through here. You can also go back and keep using some of those light fabrics if you need. And in these projects here, because I had much fewer choices in fabric. I use, like I said earlier, the exact same fabrics here. So this green and this green are the same, this green and this green are the same. So all of these fabrics are the same fabrics touching, which allowed for less pieces, but still a fun variety. In this quilt here, you can see there are different fabrics being used in different locations. And some of these I actually built from the light out to the well, I was building from here, excuse me, from the red fireplace. So I was building from dark to light. And in this one, I was building from light to dark. And that makes a fun variety. But it did also mean I had to l make sure that I chose the right log cabin frameworks when they came back together. For the most part, as I've been building here, I've only been making two sides. I haven't even been making sure that the two sides are always lining up proper um, and building out proper. But again, I'm not too concerned about that because we have the opportunity to keep building by adding a little bit as we go. So let me show you how this one's gonna sew on just because that's where we're at. And then we're gonna take one of these blocks here that's almost the right size and marry them together to finish out today's video. I think you've picking up on this. It's really, really fun. And if you curve piece, of course you could be doing that as too. But I promised you the easiest possible version of a log cabin and I think this is really it. So I'm just grabbing another one of my wonderful light fabrics, stitching on, just paying attention to making sure that I'm starting on the right side or the proper side, I should say, of each block as I go. No trimming necessary. So back to the wool mat. We're just gonna press this over. And if you're really sick of looking at your fabrics, folks, you start doing stuff like this so those both go into the scrap bin, right? Okay, remember, we're still on the light color side, so I'm gonna go ahead and set a fun new angle here. So through there, and you can see that now I can go ahead and add in one of these dark pieces. Now that's not gonna fit here. This one's not gonna fit here, but because my block is wonky, I can grab any size piece I need out of my stash. Phew, that one fits. And then we can do this. I can sew this on here with that same quarter inch. And now we're going to, again, press before we trim But now the shape and the size and the world is our oyster. We have anything we can do within this and this might be a good time to start to bring things back to square. So I might wanna come up here and go really long using this line here. Now I can trim there 
this line gives me the opportunity here to square And then if I do one last squaring here, now we're getting back into a format we can use to build into our variety of size blocks. Now this one I'm sure is not big enough yet because I haven't added all my colors, but we did get there yesterday, last night. So let's go ahead and talk about those now. I have my big block and in these projects, there are a couple that are made as accurate blocks. I don't know if there are any actually accurate blocks in this one. I like these really small ones. Those are really cool. But in this one, there are accurate blocks and wonky blocks. So we can certainly use a block like this that's accurate. And we can pair it up with a couple of other blocks. And it just happened to be, I was looking last night, and I think if I make this one and this one come together, they look like they should be just about that perfect seam allowance. So let's first build our two small ones together so we can figure out how to move forward. And you can see that I was starting to line up these edges here and I have this last piece over here prepared to go along this side. As this side comes in, that will give me the opportunity. Well, let's just go ahead and stitch it. And now I'm gonna be sewing from this top area up and it's not a perfectly straight seam. So before I even get going, let's use our practices we've just done. And I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna make sure I have a straight line. So I have a nice quarter inch to follow. I'm gonna maximize the use of my fabric. So I am gonna start up here at the top. I'm gonna to come in here and sew down now with my quarter inch seam allowance. Okay, so now we can come over here to the wool mat again and we can press this. It's an impressive, isn't it? I don't know why that always sounds so funny in my head. Okay, we're gonna trim off this tail and we're gonna leave this long until we know how it fits. Okay, set that back in your pile. Now, these two are going to come together to form this. That's looking pretty dang good. If I remember correctly, they're gonna also then come in and they're going to form into this. Looks like it makes sense so far. So now, those being about the right size, what I wanna do, cause I can tell that's gonna be a little wonky, is we're gonna start up here and let that go. If I didn't get it, I can always add more. That's the beauty of the easiest log cabins ever. So now we're gonna join these two blocks. Go ahead and head on to your ironing station and press them open. Now, of course, the wise choice is to make as many blocks as you possibly can, leaving a few pieces from each fabric pile so that you can bring them together, or maybe I should say your outer fabric piles, okay? Because I'm not exactly sure where this is gonna end up. I did get pretty fortunate and I did kind of work towards this spot so we could talk about it, but here we go. I can go ahead and start to bring now together but it's also a square, so had I been interested, I could come this way with my oranges, right? So this starts to make a really, really fun, fun look. So what we're gonna do for this one today is we're gonna go ahead and put this and this together because this has a lot of fun variety.
Okay, and now you can see how awesome that is gonna be as a quilt project, right? This is gonna be a cool table runner if you wanted to build them out that way. Of course, I wanna put all of these together and make a really nice quilt top because even in the sample I was showing you where the couple of the pieces started to overlap, it's not gonna be a big problem. And now I can come in here and I can start to look at dropping this one in up here. And then we have our fun little small one we started down in here. So most likely that'll be the next start to a project that finishes out like one of these two wild ones, right? And then the best part about the log cabin quilt is you're really kind of making a scrappy project, which makes a wonderful place to machine quilt. And I don't know if you can see decently the stitching on these projects, but a couple of fun ideas. This one, I actually did circles. I just traced like a, a bowl or something. Uh, and I left big open circles because I kind of wanted the wind field to be kind of blowing through this springtime log cabin uh, effect. And I also wanted to not overstitch these teeny little blocks. Hopefully you can see some of these are really fun. So I added a bunch of tight machine stitching around those. And in this project, again, kind of the same thing, kind of swirls around the log cabins and, or the fireplaces themselves, the reds, and then just kind of graffiti quilting out and about, doodle quilting. And it's a really great place to be able to do that style of machine quilting because nothing is really all of that important and that is the final lesson in the easiest log cabin ever is nothing is all that important folks we are simply just making quilts here especially if you're doing it like this where you're burning through leftovers from your other quilt projects that you've already been successful with so this is just a great way to work in between projects uh, you've probably heard me mention before that a lot of times after doing these big video shoots all day, I still just want to sew on something. And so coming back to these projects are really, really fun. It's also be the beginning of the year, which is a great time for us to refocus on teaching our friends about quilt making. And so I encourage you to invite them also to subscribe here and allow us to help you teach your friends hands-on sewing. Uh, make sure you're checking out a bunch of our Learn to Sew videos. I think they're very helpful. Well, of course I do. And I think they're a blast as well. Let me know in the comments below what else you'd like to know, what else you'd like to learn, and what else we can do to here to serve you on your quilting journey. Thanks for being here, folks. And until we see you next week, please stay well. Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end of the video. It really helps support our channel. If you haven't subscribed, do so now. Hit the little button to be notified every time we go live or do a new video for all of you. And here's one from the past I think you'll really enjoy.